Thank you. Um, I'm going to take you back to my high school. Well, I guess I have taken you back to my high school. Um, and remembering back when we had exams in high school, we played this game. At least I and my friends played this game. Those of us who took the exam early in the day would then tell our friends and colleagues what was on the exam. Through the hallways, there were these secret messages being passed back and forth. How was the exam? It was really hard. Make sure you know what osmosis is and what direction it goes. This messages were passed back and forth. Our teachers didn't understand this because those of us who took the exam early were hurting our grades because our friends later on would get a higher score and hurt the curve. What the teachers didn't understand is that as students, we did not see it as a student against another student. We saw it as the students against the exam. We were competing against the exam. We were turning this system into a game. Uh, and it's as if we expected, oh, got a real high score, the teachers would just get together and say, oh, wow, great job, take the next week off of school. That didn't happen. <laughs> Today I teach courses in game design and deal with students who live their lives playing computer games. I'm going to talk to you about a revolution or maybe a step towards a revolution that's happening across the United States. It's certainly being brought into my classroom, but it's also being brought into thousands of classrooms across the United States of taking ideas from gaming and bring them into the classroom in different ways. Now, if you don't think students today, just across these hallways, aren't doing the same sort of gaming as I did when I was a kid, I'd have to beg to differ. I think the technology has only changed there. And that's something we have to use. We have to use the technology of the day to really change the way we're teaching. We've already heard some great examples of that. So the first thing I want to talk to you of four points is the power of choice. And now I'm going to take you back even further. This was my middle school class. We got one of the first computer systems uh, in the state. Um, and our math teacher, Mr. Bailey, taught us how to program computers in eighth and ninth grade. Now there weren't any textbooks back then. And so Mr. Bailey created a set of index cards. And on these index cards were problems that we had to solve. And every day, I loved class. Every day I got to go to class, sort through the index cards. And some of them were worth a single point, some of them two, three, some of the hard ones four or five points. I don't think I ever did a five point one. Uh, but they're all, all there and I could pick out what I wanted to do. There was that choice. That choice engaged me in learning. It engaged me so much that I spent the rest of my life studying computers or learning or teaching others about computers. Today in my class, I'm doing the same thing. I'm replacing a required weekly assignment with hundreds of choices. Students can choose what they want, hard, easy, what level they want, and what area they want. So give these students the power of choice. So what else do you learn from games, and how, how do we see this? Um, now I'm going to go forward to my son, and he's in high school. I'm a, I'm going to talk about failure. And now when I'm thinking, when, when you hear high school failure, you're thinking negative connotations. That's bad. But I want to explain to you that today's generation does not see failure as being bad. They see failure as something that is, is necessary for success. Um, this summer, my son bought a video game. Spent most of a day playing it. Uh, it was summer, no school. And at the dinner table, I was talking to him and said, how's the, how's the computer game going? Uh, he said, oh, it's, it's okay. I'm on level eight and I haven't died yet. I said, wow, good, great game. Oh, he laughed at me and said, no, dad, the game sucks. It, it's, I should have died a dozen times before now. And he equated losing, dying, failure in this video game as something it needed to do. The fact that he was not failing meant it was boring and he wasn't going to do it anymore. Kids today 
see failure as a stepping stone to, to success. Failure is something that they are penalized for, but only by a small amount. You lose some points, you lose some time, but then you try again. Success has a greater reward. We need to bring that into the classroom. We need to have assignments that students can repeat. And computers certainly, and our, we have course management systems that are available in our classrooms that allow students to submit assignments again and again and again and keep doing them until they get to the level they want in, this, in these assignments. So students certainly see that failure is, uh, is a stepping stone uh, to more opportunity to success and that dying or failure is not a problem. Yep. Now, once you have some choice, and once you eliminate this fear of failure, then you can begin to challenge students and challenge them in different ways, on different environments. These different concepts kind of pull together in different ways. You remove the fear of failure, and then that lets you challenge students some more. Now you say, students don't want to be challenged. I know high schoolers who play this other game at school. I don't know if you realize how many games uh, we play at school. Students start the first week of class in the fall. They're given an assignment, and they'll spend an hour doing that assignment, get it all done, and turn it in, and get full points. Easy. The next week, they get another assignment. To make it a little more challenging, they spend an extra half hour watching TV. Uh, they spend an extra hour playing video games, whatever. And so then they only have half an hour at night to do this assignment. But that's the fun. Okay, can I do this assignment in half an hour? So sit down, write this paper in half an hour, turn it in, see if they can get full points or not. And if they don't, they'll try again the next week. By the end of the term, I have students who do not start their homework until the bus ride to school, and then the game is on. You step on the bus, then you can start your homework. Your, your class is at 11 o'clock. You've got three hours in English class. You are writing your paper for your history class later in that day. Between classes, you're running to the computer lab with your flash drive and printing off the paper that's due in 15 minutes. That is the game, the challenge that these students have. If we do not challenge students, they will challenge themselves and often in unproductive ways. So we have to look at how. How are we going to challenge students? What are we going to bring to them? What I'm looking at is letting students have choices in how they challenge themselves. Not have a, a single linear path, and we've heard other examples of this non-linear teaching. And so, and I'm struggling as a teacher with this. Having a class where different students are doing different things at the same time. Uh, and they choose what path and what skills they do. I've taken our course and broken it into skill sets, and each student can figure out what skills they want to hone, and then every day they come in and choose. And then there are the assignments. There's just not a, a fixed assignment. There's assignments at different levels, and the students can choose at what level they want to challenge themselves. So how do you mo motivate students to accept these challenges. Next thing I want to talk about and the last point is competition. We certainly see the power of competition in our sporting lives, in our sporting events. Students spend thousands of hours preparing and competing. We need to bring that idea into the classroom. I remember in algebra class, our algebra teacher had on the sideboard had a bunch of little horses and each horse had a student's name on it. And after every quiz, after every assignment, you got a couple points and your horse moved forward. I loved this. The, the <laughs> course was a race. And I was good at algebra. And so my horse is always one of the top five horses. And I tried. I, every assignment, I had to get all the points. Every quiz, I had to know what was on it. I had to keep my horse up there in the pack. It certainly motivated me to succeed. But 
Competition is not always a positive force. And in game design, we allow uh, players to choose the type of competition they want because one type of competition does not fit everyone. Remember back in elementary school, we had weekly spelling tests. And we had these classic crowns made out of construction paper with our names on it. And every week we got a star, a gold star, if you got that week's spelling questions right. While I am good at algebra, I was not good at spelling. (laughs) And there are those today who would argue I'm still not good at spelling, and in that way the educational system failed me. Um, But all I remember is that every day I sat in class and looked up at the front of the board and there was this constant reminder that I was stupid and that I could not do this work no matter what I did. Competition was very much a negative force in my life at that point. So we need to use competition, but we need to let students choose how they compete. In video games today, there's always an option. Do you want to compete against your friends? And lots of people like that. But other people don't. And do you want to just compete against the computer? There's always the the option to just play against yourself or play against the computer. It's more of a private, personal competition. And that's great and driving for different people. We live in a global society And now, in a lot of these computer games, we are seeing the ability to compete across nations, across continents. Recently, I was playing a racing game with my son, and he always beats me, and it was kind of disappointing. I I always am losing to him. Then he showed me this map and this graph that showed everyone in the world in this racing game And I was better than 30% of the people in the whole world. And I was, wow, I thought, that's really good. Of the whole world, I'm better than 30% of those people. That made me feel really good. And so this ability to compete at different levels, we need to bring that into our classrooms so that we can change how we learn. Now together, these things all kind of tie together. We need this choice. We need choice in how we compete. We need to be able to challenge people and then we need to recognize that students can fail and build that failure into how we create our systems. So hopefully, we'll see this revolution going on in our classrooms and in classrooms across the country. Like I say, there's, there's thousands of classrooms doing this uh, across the United States. Thank you. <laughs>